Good morning and welcome. Kina, thank you so much for your warm welcome and I'm honored to be here. Thank you. So as Tina had mentioned, I am a, I'm a brain injury survivor from a childhood illness, and I'm also an interfaith minister. And so my brain is happiest when I engage through storytelling and imagery. So I will um, begin with a story and share a few slides. So one morning in mid-October, I enjoyed a leisurely stroll through the Arboretum. Beautiful, crisp autumn weather, gorgeous yellow and gold leaves. Along my path, I noticed a boy about six years old. He was gazing up at the sun, wearing solstice glasses like these. I was struck by the expression on his face. It was filled with awe. His enthusiasm was infectious. As I drew near, he extended his glasses to me and asked, wanna see? Absolutely, I replied. So I put them on. They work so much better out <laughs> outside than here. But together, he and I viewed the annular solar eclipse through the same pair of glasses, the same collective lenses the same vantage point in following the Earth's orbit around the sun. The vastness of the world suddenly felt intimately tender and personal through the spirit of shared unity. This is what equity should look and feel like around accessibility and inclusion for all. Equity is like a pair of shared solstice glasses, a communal gathering space where we exchange our individual lenses with each other to perceive the world through new filters, a spirit of curiosity and novelty, an alternative perspective leading to greater insights, understanding, and compassion, a grace-filled space where differences are held with integrity and wholeness the kind of equity that calls forth a childlike enthusiasm for collective beauty, wonder, and awe. In my ministry, I advocate for equity, accessibility, and inclusion for people who are perceived as different through society's lenses. Why? Because I know what it feels like to be different in both visible and invisible ways. My lens through which I view the world can be summed up in four distinct images. And now here comes my executive functioning uh, work in figuring out this slide. So let me give this a try here. Okay, hold on for one sec. Um, share screen and then, okay, working on it. This is the real life experience of brain injury survival. Okay, share screen, here we go. Okay, so I think, am I, Tina, do I have, I'm looking at all four slides now, or are we looking at one? Currently we have you, we're looking at your drive. So you need to open the slide and then, um, and then you can select through them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I what my notes are is that I do this safari uh, slide share button, which I did, and then double click on the image. Okay, um, so you're seeing these four images now. Is it like correct? We're looking at your drive at the moment, so I'm not sure why it didn't open up to what we what we reviewed when you okay. when you went over it, but it should. So I'm going to click on this. I don't know, so we're gonna just roll with it. And <laughs> you, you'll see all four of them. And I'm sorry, this is, um, I'm learning as we go. The first image, so we'll we'll look at this one here with the um, my backpacking one. So um, in here, so, oh, I was just saying, so like the boy 
um, in the Arboretum with his solstice glasses, I too experienced a moment of wonder and awe grounded in nature's beauty. In this photo, I'm a six-year-old child. It's June 1977. I joined my family on a summer backpacking trip in Northern California. The vastness of the world came into laser sharp focus when a tiny red ladybug landed in the palm of my outstretched hand. Is it possible to feel both expansively huge and intimately small all at the same time? I believe so. I believe this, this is what awe feels like. And just a few days later, I viewed the world through drastically different lenses. I was now a critically sick patient lying in the intensive care unit at Stanford University's Children's Hospital. My neurosurgeon, Dr. Jerry Silverberg, diagnosed my brain injury. It turned out that I was born with a cluster of abnormal blood vessels known as an arteriovenous malformation. AVM for short. On that day, the blood vessels burst, leading to a life-threatening brain hemorrhage. What a sharp contrast between these two vantage points. Prior to my illness, I viewed the world through the lens of a healthy, white, blonde-haired, able-bodied girl. All the rules of mainstream society played in my favor. I belonged. After my illness, I was too busy tending to my survival to think much about the social implications of my health and how people might perceive me. That it is until I returned to school in second grade. I will never forget that day. The California weather happened to be quite breezy. I stepped onto the school playground, eager to greet my friends. I couldn't wait to laugh and play with them like I used to prior to my illness. As they ran towards me with cheers of welcome, a sudden gust of wind blew off my white cotton hat. In that moment, the world turned eerily silent and still. Without my hat, I stood before them revealing my shaved head from brain surgery and a large and sightly scar. I noticed expressions of fear on my friends' faces. My altered appearance changed the lens through which I, through which I saw the world in which they perceived me. For the first time in my life, I fell out of favor. I no longer belonged. I discovered the pain of what it felt like to be outed, to be othered, to be different. It didn't feel good. In a few short months, my blonde hair grew back and I resumed the appearance of a healthy, wholesome, mainstream child. And just like that, I was welcomed back into society as if nothing had changed. But I couldn't unsee the fear that I saw on the children's faces that day on the school playground. I couldn't unfeel the pain that I felt in my body. It birthed a social conscience in me. At a young age, I felt called to expand the welcome table of hospitality, inclusion, and liberation for those who are marginalized and oppressed. It shaped my current ministry around advocating for accessibility and inclusion for brain injury survivors, along with those who identify as neurodivergent. Fast forward to November, 2023, and this is where the other two slides are. My husband, daughter, and I visited my parents in Palo Alto, California for Thanksgiving. During our visit, I had the good fortune of reuniting with my Stanford neurosurgeon, Dr. Silverberg, 
to thank him for saving my life 46 years ago. And I'm gonna end the share, stop share. Okay, so now we're back here. That reunion highlighted the epitome of deep gratitude and celebration for life, health, love, and community connection. It also clarified and defined the scope of my ministry. It included three overlapping fields, healthcare, interfaith community building, and environment. What do these three fields share in common? In one word, belonging. Let me illustrate or outline these three specific fields and how they intersect with each other. As for healthcare, Dr. Vivek Murthy, US Surgeon General called loneliness, isolation and alienation a public health crisis. He also expressed something quintessentially beautiful at the core of each person's being. He said, healing is about making whole. To be a healer, you have to be able to listen, to learn and to love. Healing leads to relationships, community and belonging. In my ministry, I want to address the pain point of isolation so that we can build a bridge to belonging and social connection for everyone's health and well-being, especially for those who are perceived as different through society's lenses. As an interfaith community, as for interfaith community building, I can't think of a better role model than Fred Rogers. Many of you may be familiar with his children's public television show called Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. It first aired in 1968 and ran for 33 years with its final episode concluding in 2001. Fred Rogers was an ordained minister like me. Public television served as his chosen platform to live out his ministry outside of traditional church walls. He addressed issues of race, divorce, death, and embraced people of all abilities, neurotypical and neurodivergent alike. He met the access needs of children through a deep sense of community connection and belonging. Television host Charlie Rose highlighted two interview clips from 1994 and 1997 titled, Remembering Mr. Rogers. In one of these clips, Charlie asked Fred this question, who has made a difference in your life? Here was Fred's response, lots of people, but a lot of people who have allowed me to have some silence. I don't think we give that gift very much anymore. I'm very concerned that our society is much more interested in information than wonder, in noise rather than silence. How do we encourage reflection? The wheels in my mind started to turn. Fred's thought lit a creative spark in me. Where might I locate my ministry outside of traditional church walls in order to embrace these values of silence, wonder, and reflection. My eyes grew wide with excitement as I happened upon an idea. This brings me to my third field, environment. Robin Wall Kimmer is a Potawatomi botanist and author. She is also the director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. One of my favorite lines in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, is that paying attention is a form of reciprocity with the living world, receiving the gifts with open eyes and open heart. 
I want to ground my ministry through a reciprocal connection with nature in relationship to our bodies. Since this overall, since overall health and wellness in our bodies is directly related to social ties, then what better place than a public garden to serve as a sanctuary beyond the traditional church walls? First, it draws people together united by a shared appreciation for nature's beauty. This community build, uh, bridge building breaks down the public health crisis of isolation. Furthermore, science has shown that connecting our bodies in tranquil green spaces benefits everyone, neurotypical and neurodivergent alike, in reducing stress and increasing calm. So good so far, right? But what about equity? This question led me on a nature-based journey seeking to connect beauty with justice in the name of equity. During a recent garden tour at the Kubota Garden, I discovered what I was looking for. The Kubota Garden is a stunning 20-acre landscape that blends Japanese garden concepts with native Northwest plants. It is located in the Rainier Beach neighborhood in Seattle's South End, one of the most diverse zip codes in the state of Washington. Fujitaro Kubota lived for 94 years from 1879 to 1973. He was a landscape designer who carried seeds of change both literally and figuratively. Not only did he bring seeds from his native Japan to plant in his Japanese-inspired Kubota garden in Seattle, but he carried these same seeds to the Japanese internment camp in Minidoka, Idaho, during World War II. Fujitaro's nature-based Shinto religion sustained his spirit in the face of racial injustice. By grounding himself in the natural world, he found the inner resources to design a beautiful rock garden within the walls of his imprisonment. The war may have contain his body, but not his spirit. Fujitara designed his garden in 1927. It became a public park in 1987. Today, it is maintained by the Seattle Parks and Recreation and the Kaboto Garden Foundation. This, I believe, is what makes the Kaboto Garden such an ideal environment for a nature-based approach towards equity. For example, I may invite folks from the Brain Injury Alliance of Washington for a visit to the Kubota Garden. Here is how this one connection ignites a chain of positive events leading to increased equity. The Kubota Garden Foundation offers a wide range of community events to meet diverse interests. Some of these garden activities include monthly public garden tours, a nature-based guided meditation called forest bathing, a Japanese buto dance performance, taiko drumming, jazz in the garden, an iris exhibition, a pollinator safari, and a soapstone carving workshop for youth. Not only are these offerings appealing to people of diverse ages and abilities, but they also meet important access needs. These access needs connect people's diverse learning styles in environments where they can thrive. In my case, I experienced executive functioning difficulties due to my brain injury. To help alleviate these cognitive challenges, I find it restorative to ground my body through sensory touch and kinesthetic movement. Meditative activities like forest bathing helps to quiet my mind and regulate stress in my body. Other neurodivergent people may be drawn to alternative garden activities custom tailored to their unique brain body makeup. It all comes down to the power of agency and choice grounded 
in access and equity. A model of asset-based strengths versus a deficit-based mindset. Imagine yourself engaging in this garden with diverse people, living diverse lives with visible and invisible challenges. It's not so clear anymore who is neurotypical and who is neurodivergent. This is the creative tension that we are called to hold around accessibility and inclusion, especially differences that are hidden in plain sight. According to the CDC, 61 million Americans identify as having a disability of some kind, and about 10% of those are invisible disabilities. Some of these invisible disabilities include dyslexia, autism, epilepsy, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, multiple sclerosis, lupus, fibromyalgia, mental illness, arthritis, deafness or difficulty hearing, traumatic brain injury, and acquired brain injury. By breaking down societal barriers, we learn to break through, break open, and break free into a more expansive, liberated, and vibrant way of being in the world. Who better than nature herself to serve as the ultimate preacher, teacher, prophet, and artist in gently guiding us towards greater healing and wholeness through the soul nourishing garden. I feel deeply grateful for the many gifts that the Kubota Garden offers to the public. It serves as a peaceful gathering place to foster community connection and belonging. This beautiful, tranquil green space nurtures overall health and wellness. It also cultivates the soul qualities of silence, wonder, and reflection. And finally, reciprocity in nature is at the root of healing and wholeness. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Antoine de saying, Oh, je pray. I took I took Spanish, not French. <laughs> so my effort. This is from his book, The Little Prince. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to, to the eye. May your hearts be inspired by beauty, wonder, and awe. And may people of all abilities feel welcomed at the Kubota Garden with dignity, respect, and belonging. May it be so. Thank you. I am open to Q&A and just engaging in a conversation of what is stirring in people's minds and hearts. Thanks, Jennifer. That was a great presentation. Um, before we start Q&A, I just want to remind everyone here that 